Listen, we're going to get started because I'm not sure how long this is going to last tonight. We have a lot of territory to cover. So let's bow our heads. Let's have prayer. Father, as we study tonight, we want you to guide our lives. There's so much in your word that we need to know. And so little that we know. We want to walk faithfully with you and we want to be like you. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit right now to guide our lives. And that you would help us to be faithful to you. The things that we hear and see that you will implant them in our minds and recreate us to have new hearts. And we just thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, quiz, first thing. This is a hard one. I'm psyching you out now. It's really not hard, you know. Jesus changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday when he rose from the dead. True or false? Jesus changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Doug, you're supposed to be quiet during the quiz. There is no record of any Sunday being kept as a regular day of worship in the New Testament church. There is no record of any Sunday being kept as a regular day of worship in the New Testament church. Now, Delsey, did you tell me you were leaving? Or you were just getting an envelope? Okay. All right. The book of Acts records 84 Sabbaths as kept by the Apostle Paul. The book of Acts records 84 Sabbaths as kept by the Apostle Paul. Number four, the issue in the Sabbath Sunday question is loyalty to God versus loyalty to the little horn. And number five, the New Testament records many instances where the New Testament church met on the seventh day Sabbath after the resurrection. The New Testament records many instances where the New Testament church met on the seventh day Sabbath after the resurrection. Okay, how many of you are ready for answers? All right. I expect to see 100s on everybody. Some of you now have done, you've done, like there was five questions, you'll put, you'll put five for your score. And I'm just saying, if you got them all right, put 100 up there. Because that looks better than five. Okay. Well, it was better than seminary. Sometimes we had one question. And that was for the whole quarter that we were pass or fail. We had no midterms. It was one question. You were pass or fail. Jesus changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday when he rose from the dead. False. That's right. Uh, Remember we said that there is no record that Jesus changed anything. Is there? Okay. And number two. It says... There is no record of any Sunday being kept as a regular day of worship in the New Testament. True, that's right. That's right. There is no record. We have none. Number three. The book of Acts records 84 Sabbaths as kept by the Apostle Paul. Ooh, is that hard? Well, there was 78 and then there was three more. Or four, was it? Six. Six more, yeah. So 84 means it's true. That's right. Do you think, Doug, I would actually try to trick you? <laughs> Me, yes. Everybody else, probably not. <laughs> okay, number four. The issue, of, uh, the issue in the Sabbath Sunday question is loyalty to God versus loyalty to the little horn. True. You see, 
the little horn is the one who thinks to change or intends to change times and laws. So if we're true to Sunday, we are following him. If we're true to Sabbath, we're following who? God, because God gave us the Sabbath. And then number five, the New Testament records many instances where the New Testament church met on the seventh day Sabbath after the resurrection. True. I mean, 84 Sabbaths is a long time, isn't it? So that was a year and a half. So, see, that was just the amount of time that Paul preached there. Doesn't count the others. Okay? And there probably are more than that because we know that that most churches were still honoring the Sabbath by as late as 600 A.D. Okay? All right. So, common question. Frequently asked at this time, if Scripture is so clear, how can the ministers, evangelists, and their followers not accept it? Well, the Bible gives us an answer. Take your Bible and let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 10, and the Bible says this. And actually, I want to begin with verse 9. And it says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of who? Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who, what? Perish. Because they, what? Did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. When the love of the truth, when we have the love of the truth, do we run from it? We hang on to it, don't we? And people who hear it and turn from it are certainly not in love with it, are they? And who's leading them? The devil. The one thing you have to remember, the devil wants to do anything that will keep you from being close to God. His goal, his game is to separate you from Christ. That's his game. So today, don't put your Bibles up. People want to hear love, love, love. There's a song by that. It's all I need is love. I don't remember who wrote it though. But anyway, let's go to these texts. 2 Timothy 3.16. People want love and not doctrines. Now, let me say this to you, but I can't multitask. So, um, let me say this to you. When the Bible says, when the Bible talks about doctrines, you know, you hear about, say, non-denominational churches. They don't teach doctrines. Folks, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. You believe in something or you wouldn't be at church. So you got to be teaching something. And the word doctrine simply means teachings. That's all it means. So when we're talking about Bible doctrines, we're talking about the teachings of who? The Bible, the Bible but specifically who were, who's, who's the center of the Bible? Jesus. Jesus is. So we're talking about Jesus' teachings. So do I want to be caught turning away one of Jesus' teachings? No, I want to hang on to them. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17, it says this. Some scripture is given by inspiration. Oh, that's right. I just want to see if you're still awake. 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God might be what? Complete or perfect. Thoroughly equipped for how many good works? Every good work. And so we need to understand what the Bible says because it's going to teach us where we need to go. It's, it's good for doctrine, for reproof, and the words <laughs> doctrine, you know, for the teachings. For the teaching. We need to know this. Let's go to 2 Timothy 4. And that is verse 2. And let's see here. And it says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teachings. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So, so Timothy is, uh, so the book of Timothy is telling us that the times come when people aren't going to listen to sound teachings. You think we're in that day and hour now? Mm -hmm. There was a day and hour where, you know, you had churches in all communities, all kinds of churches, and people went to those churches. Never did I ever think there would be a day when we would have children in America who had never darkened the doors of a church. But today it is true. But according, they would not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to what? Fables. When we teach things that just make people feel good, are we being fair to them? Oh, we need to feel good, but there's sometimes when we don't feel good that it helps us to get on our knees, right? It helps us to understand who we really are connected to. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. The Bible says, and I'm going to start up at verse 8. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So can you misuse the word of God, the law of God? Yeah, you can beat people over the head with it, can't you? But Jesus says, unless you love me, don't worry about it. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Only if you love him. Because if you don't love him, it's called righteousness by works. And we know the law doesn't save us, and we know that the works of the law does not save us, but the works of the law are simply um, a sign that we've accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. We want to walk with him. So it says here, it's good, but we can use it bad. And then it says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. Did you hear that? The law is not made for a righteous person. You know why that's true? Because those who love Jesus are following. They do it because they love him. And whatever they do is in harmony with God. Okay? So that's why it says that. And so it goes on. Let's see, let me find my place again. And it says, uh, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and the insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So lawless people are going to be in trouble, aren't they? Well, let's go to the next one, 4.6. 1 Timothy 4.6. If you instruct my brethren, 
in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine, the good teachings, of which you have certainly, or have carefully followed. What are we supposed to do with the things we learn from the Word of God? To carefully follow them. Okay? It means we're engaged with the God we serve. And then, Romans 6.16. And the Bible says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves to obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Two ways, right? You can go in a path of righteousness or a path of unrighteousness. And then Romans 16 and verse 17. This is a powerful text. Now I urge you, brethren, note. What does that mean? Pay attention. attention. Write down. Note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and do what? Avoid Avoid them. Does that mean you should not try to help people to know about Christ who who are kind of a, a rebel rouser? No, you should try. But they should not be the people you hang around with all the time. Remember in the book of Corinthians, it says, By beholding, and this is a paraphrased version, you become changed. So if you are watching bad things or watching bad behavior, after a while, you become the bad behavior. You have to be careful. So anyway... So, the Bible basically is telling us that it's through doctrines, through the teachings of God's Word, that we learn and we understand the character of God. That's how we know. And and, and tonight is going to be a really good study, and it's just one of about three or four in a row. Boom, 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 boom. In fact, probably about the next five or six is going to just knock your socks off. They're good. And I love these. This is, this, we're now getting to the part that I really, really am fascinated with because it just reminds me of what God has done for us. So uh, let's do a little review here. And uh, it says there, Jesus is so long-suffering, he doesn't want us to misunderstand these important prophecies. So I want us to kind of regroup with a little bit and remember what Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 was all about. And if we remember, there was a... Daniel 2, there was a, 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 um, an image made of gold and silver and bronze and, and iron and iron and clay. And that first head of gold represented Babylon. And then the chest and arms of silver represented Medo-Persia. And this is all right there in the book of Daniel. Daniel tells us this, right? You don't get it in chapter 2, but if you go to da- chapter 7, you see it. Chapter 8, you see it. But um, we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, and then Greece, and then Rome with the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay was Europe divided, the division of Europe. And then when we get to Daniel chapter 7, we have Babylon as a lion. Instead of metals now, we have animals. And so there's Babylon, and then there's Greece the leopard, and then there's the bear, which is Medo-Persia, and then the ugly beast. Now, that beast is kind of ugly, um, is Rome, represents Rome. And then Rome was divided, right? And so when Rome was divided, it uprooted three, and a little horn came up. And when that little horn came up, that little horn is who we've been talking about for the last couple of lessons. All right? So tonight, we're going to be talking about Daniel's longest time prophecy. Now, we're, we're not, this, we, don't, we can't even cover this in one night. 
But we're going to cover this as fast as I can cover it and, 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 and still be able to let you understand what's going on here. But it's really good. And so um, if you open your lesson there, um, I've already said the next, the next three lessons, but uh, there's really more than three because I, 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 you know, I have the table of contents and so I know what's coming. And so, and I've only taught this class maybe a hundred times. So um, the point is, is that there's a lot of good stuff coming. You do not want to miss. And I know that some of you already told me that you, you might have to, do it, but, but listen, um, Teddy's recording. And if we can get some DVDs, and if you miss, you need to follow up because you need to know what you missed instead of skipping over it. And even if you read it, you won't get the full gist of it. So, so you, need to, you need to stay caught up, stay caught up. Um, and one of the nice things about this lesson is it's going to reveal history from Daniel's day right on down towards the end of time. I mean, time things not things in heaven, but things that happen on earth. And so God's people, they're going to love what's happening. But if you're not walking with God, what we're getting ready to study is not good news for you. But it's good news for those who love the Lord and want to walk with Him. And so you're going to enjoy this. So we're going to go now into the panorama of the empires. Now I'm going to cover a lot of this fast because this is repeat and enlarge. You remember what we talked about repeat and enlarge? So, so we're, we're going to go through this fast because I want to get to the real meaty stuff, all right? But um, anyway, in order to understand Daniel, it's necessary that you understand what has already been told. And so we've gone through some of that, but um, Daniel is repeat and large, repeat and large. We said it was outline prophecy. That means that that Daniel gives us an outline in Daniel 2. And then in Daniel 7, he gives us the same outline, but he gives us more details. And now as we move into Daniel 8, we're going to get the same outline. Starts at a different point, but it's the same outline, and it's going to give us even more details. Make sense? So let's go to the uh, first question there. But actually, before we go there, let's, let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Let's read the first four verses. Daniel 8, let's read that first four verses. It says, in what year? The third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was in Sushan, the citadel, which is the providence of Elam. And I saw in the vision and uh, that I was by the river Uli. Then I lifted up my eyes, and I saw that I saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. I saw a ram pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did accordingly to his will and became great. Um, here we have it. It says, in what year? In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar. And I want you to remember here that Babylon is not mentioned now because this is that the, towards the tail end. Remember when Belshazzar was in power, uh, somebody came in through the front door that they left unlocked. And they drained the riverbed and walked in and they took over Babylon. Well, that's about to happen. So Daniel's not even recording that. He's recording who's going to follow. And he says, uh, in the third year of the reign. And so question number two says, what kind of animal did Daniel see in vision that conquered in every direction? What did he see? Ram. He saw this ram. And the ram had how many horns? Two, two horns. And so, 
Who does this ram represent? When you go to Daniel 8.20, it tells us who, who it represents, doesn't it? It represents the kings of Media and Persia. Media and Persia. This would be the territory that they were conquering, that they were taking over here. And then in question number three, it says, oh, I'm sorry, did I already do three? That was three, wasn't it? Okay, I'm losing my numbers here. Uh, don't say anything about that, Doug. Um, say what about what, sir? <laughs> Go to Daniel 8 and verse 20. Daniel 8 and verse 20. Because, you know, you, you, you think about this, but Daniel himself tells us who this is. And in verse 20, it says this. Um, the ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And then the male goat, after that, it represents who? So, the next animal that Daniel sees in vision is... The male goat coming from the west. And he sees this goat. And how many horns does this goat have? A notable horn. A big horn, it says. And, and it says, number five, who does the rough goat represent? And what does the great horn symbolize? Represents... Greece. Who is that in Greece? Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great is the one who's in charge. But I told you previously about Alexander the Great that he was a young man. Died at about 31 and a half to 32 years old. Remind you of anybody else that died between 31. But Jesus didn't die like this guy died. This guy died and the notes kind of say that he, you know, he died from some kind of disease. But history tells us he died as a drunk. He could not control his alcohol, and he died from alcohol poison, and prob which is probably what happened. And then it says that before he died, he sat down on his bed, and he cried like a baby because he thought he had conquered the whole world. There was nothing left to conquer. And Alexander the Great marched across the country. He did phenomenal at he was phenomenal at just wiping people out and getting rid of them and taking over that's who he was you did not want to meet these guys you think the russians were bad over in ukraine mm -mm, you don't want to meet these guys they were bad and so it was alexander the great and he was that great horn but question number six says he was the first horn i didn't put that up there i'm sorry but now you have it. What did the male goat do to the ram? He conquered that ram, didn't he? He destroyed him. Boom. He just knocked him down. He was gone. That was it. There's nothing left to do. And then number seven says, what happened to the great horn when it was strong? When it came into, when it came into place. What? The large horn was broke. And then it says next after that. Four notable horns came up. And so who do these four notable horns represent? Four generals. It says what is the meaning of the four horns that come up? What are those meanings? And the Bible tells us that the four horns are four kingdoms. And what happened was that. When Alexander the Great died, his four generals, Ptolemy, Seleucus, Cassander, and Lysimachus, they wanted this kingdom. They didn't want to fight over it. They said, okay, you take this part, you take this part, you take this part. You. I don't know if they did any, 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 mo. I don't know what they did, but they divided up into four sections. And they said, we're not wasting any more fighting. We're just going to take our own part. And that's what they did. And they divided everything. Well, Number 10 says, or number 9 says, what does Daniel see coming up out of one of the four winds of heaven? What does he see? A little horn. Now, here's what I want you to understand. 
the Bible says he saw this coming up among the four winds. I want you to understand that because this little horn did not come up among one of the other horns. He came up, on, came up among the four winds. Winds in Bible prophecy represent strife, commotion. And so in all the commotion, all the strife, this little horn starts to come up. Now, the word wind is, can be, that word wind in the original language can be masculine or it could be feminine. It could be either or. But when it says out of one of them, it's masculine. When it says uh, a horn, horn is feminine. So we know that it came up from among the winds, from among the strife and commotion that was going on during that time, and not, during, not from another, coming out of another horn. Make sense? And um, you'll probably never even think about that again, but that's it. So it says, who does this little horn stand up against? He stands up against who? Who is the prince of princes? So this little horn is going to stand up against Jesus himself. That's what he's going to do. Now, when you think about it, he's going to oppose Christ. And so, what power does this little, little horn have to be? Who is it? At the time, it's pagan Rome. There was no papal Rome at that time. It's pagan Rome. And remember, who was in control of the, who was dominating the world at the time when Jesus was born? Pagan Rome. And so here we have this little horn, and this little horn we know is not going to end here. The Bible says in the next question that he waxes great. But so this, the point that I make here with this little horn, that in Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, it says there is none like pagan Rome. There's nobody like it. And that's when it's little. But it's going to get bigger, isn't it? The next question said, oh, um, here in these verses, Daniel 8, 8 to 12, says we see pagan Rome evolving into papal Rome. Papal Rome. It says, did the little horn stay little? No, it did not. It grew up. It grew up. And that's the one thing I think about when I read this is that I, when I think about the church of Rome, the universal church, quote, unquote, where did it get its roots from? Pagan Rome. Is there any reason why you should not understand that that's why, you ha that's why the Christian church has many false teachings today? They came out of pagan Rome. And the papal church came out of pagan Rome, from pagan to papal. And let me help you understand this pagan, because there's some people don't understand what a pagan is anymore. I mean, I used to remember sometimes that um, my mother would tell me, "Stop acting like a like a, like a pagan." And um, we knew what that meant. And so, but when it comes to papal Rome, what does that represent? Papal means government of the papas. Okay, government of the papas. So we came from pagan Rome to the government of the papas, which means the government of the popes. And it says that this horn grows up. And it, the King James says it waxes great. Um, now, the next question, I'm just going to pass through these because in lesson number 15, we're going to cover every one of these so right now you're just going to get to fill in the blanks it says as the little horn grew up what five things did this little horn do first of all it says that it exalted himself as high as the prince of hosts who would that be so he exalts himself above christ hmm. then it says by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away. We're going to talk about that when we get into the sanctuary. He, he, he does away with the daily sacrifices. And then the next one says that he cast what down? 
the sanctuary. The sanctuary. And we'll be studying about the sanctuary as well. And then it says he cast what else down to the ground? Truth. So he's stopping on the truth, isn't he? Does the devil want you to know truth? No. Because again, if you know truth, you can beat him at his own game. Then it says he did all of this and prospered. Does it ever, do you ever wonder why it seems like evil is always winning? Well, remember, I told you we were living in a great controversy. The battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And it always looks like that evil is winning. Not all the time, but a lot of times. And you've just made that clear when you responded, yeah, why? But they do because we're in this battle with, with, the, with the battle between the force of good and forces of evil. When the devil fell, he took his war from heaven to earth. Not because he had a choice, because he, 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 was, he was put there in the, in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the only way he could get off that tree is to take Adam and Eve down. And what he tries to do today is to take you down. Because for every one of you he can take down, he hurts God even more. And so he practiced and he prospered. It seems like the enemy is prospering. But let me tell you something that we've learned before. God is in control. And if God's people trust him, God will take him through their fiery furnaces. Right? He'll take them through the fiery furnaces. So, um, in the note up there on the top of page 4, it says, um, we're not just obviously dealing with pagan Rome, pagan Roman Empire. We're also dealing with with the Roman Empire, and the little horn changes from the Roman Empire and becomes a religious political power. And so that he cast truth to the ground, he practices it, he prospers it, and it says that he destroys the truth of God in his sanctuary. How many churches today even talk about the sanctuary? Hmm? That's Old Testament. We don't need that. Really? We're going to see how important that is. Because everything in the sanctuary represents Jesus. And we're going to see that. And so he, he practiced and he prospered. And Daniel 8 uses the same symbol to represent both powers, pagan and papal. I want you to understand that. Before, there was two different symbols, but now it turns into one symbol. It is the little horn, and it grows great. It starts out as pagan Rome, but it gets bigger and bigger until it finally turns into papal Rome. And so this little horn is something that we need to understand. We need to know who this is. So let's go to question number 13 there. And it says, as Daniel contemplates at all that he has seen, all that he has seen in this vision, what question was asked? As Daniel is looking at this, how long? Daniel sees all this happening, and yet the, even the angels want to know, how long? He hears them talking. How long? How long is this vision going to be? This vision that begins with Medo-Persia and takes us right down to papal Rome. How long is it going to be? And the answer comes, doesn't it, unto 2,300 days. And then it says the sanctuary would be filled. How long? How long is it going to take? 2,300 days. 2,300 days. I mean, think about that. Now, 
If you're talking literal time, 2,300 days would only be about six and a half years, right? But we know this is going to take us from Medo-Persia right down to pagan, a papal Rome. Uh, we can't be talking about literal 2,300 days, can we? We can't. And so we learned earlier that the Bible talks about prophecy as a day for a year and we'll go to the next question there but in Daniel 8 this is going to uncover a lot of time and so how do we look at this when we go to the next question there it says does the Bible support the use of a day for a year in Bible prophecy this is in Ezekiel 4 6 it's also in Numbers 34 I believe it is and um, it says this I have laid on you a day for each year. Now, let me say this. Every time, you know, you look at something in the Bible and it talks about a day, it doesn't mean that it's a year. Only in Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy uses a day for year principle. So, number 16 <clears throat> says, What is Daniel told about the vision of the evening and the morning? What is he told? Shut it up, Daniel. Shut it up. Now, I want you to think about this. Daniel understands everything there is to know about this vision, except what? When does it start? When does this 2,300 day start? He doesn't understand this. And so, when it comes to uh, understanding it, he's, he, he, he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it. In fact, can you imagine what it would be like to see through time and to see all this play out? And I'm sure he saw things that he had never seen before as God chose him and reveals to him this vision. But 2,300 days, that's the part of Daniel's vision he didn't understand. That's the part that he doesn't understand. And the, and the angel says, shut it up. Well, question 17 says, why didn't God give Daniel an interpretation of the 2300 days at this time? What was happening with Daniel at that time? He's fainted. He got sick. Can you imagine seeing what Daniel saw? Being a man or a woman of God and seeing what's happening to God's people, you, you already have an idea of some of the things that took place in the dark ages and things. And Daniel sees this stuff, and he hears the angel say, how long is this going to last? But the Bible says Daniel gets faint, and he's sick. and um, So, if you're faint and you're sick, then how are you going to understand it? He doesn't, he doesn't have that information. And the Bible says nobody understood that. Even the angels didn't understand that. They did not understand. They understood everything clearly on the first part of the vision, but the part they didn't understand was the 2,300 days. So when Daniel saw this, what did he do? What did Daniel do? It says, what, what is Daniel doing when chapter 9 opens up? Let me take you back to Daniel 2. When Daniel and all the wise men were in trouble, what was the first thing Daniel did? He prayed about it. So here we are in Daniel chapter 8. He, he's sick at what he sees, and he doesn't understand it, and he's studying the Word of God. He's trying to figure out what does this 2,300 days mean, and he's praying about it, and he's praying about it. And the Bible records that he has this understanding of seeking God's face, and he's talking to God about this 2,300 days. What do we do with this? What is it? Show me, Lord. Who comes to Daniel? Who comes to Daniel? It says that Gabriel came, and is this the first time we've seen Gabriel? No, he's been there before, hasn't he? Gabriel has been there before. And so here he comes. Gabriel didn't understand either, but Gabriel brings him the answer. And it says that Gabriel comes, and 
tells him um, that he's going to give him the understanding. Number 20. What is the purpose of Gabriel's visit this time? I guess I just answered that, didn't I? He says, I have come forth to give you skill to understand. Consider the matter and understand the vision. So, what vision is he talking about? Are you guys still with me? You going to sleep on me? I know we're doing a lot of history, but the point is, that what was the only part of Daniel 8 that Daniel didn't understand? The 2300 days. It's important that you understand this. This is the part that Daniel did not understand the 2300 days. And so the, the, the angel Gabriel comes, and just remember, this is the same angel. Where do we see this angel again later? Not in Daniel, but a long ways down the road. Right. To Mary. Oh, Gabriel, he's an old man, isn't he? He's thousands of years old. So, Gabriel comes, he says, I'm going to help you to understand. And um, so, the only thing that Daniel needed to understand was what he did not understand in Daniel the 8th chapter. And that is important for you to remember why. And I'll tell you that before we leave tonight. Okay? You will get that answer. But you need to remember that. Gabriel comes. Daniel, I'm going to tell you. So, there's been no new vision since the vision of the 2300 days. And the 2300 days was the thing not explained in chapter 8. And it says, the same angel comes in, Daniel, in chapter 8 and appears to Daniel in chapter 9. Daniel is now told the understanding of the, of the, to understand the prophecy. The only vision to be understood was the vision of the 2300 days. Have I said that enough? Is it clear? Therefore, Daniel 9, 24 and onward would be logic, the logical place to find the interpretation of Daniel of the 2300 days of Daniel 8. So, let's go there. Let's look at the 70 weeks of Bible prophecy because that's where it all begins. And let's go to um, question 21. And it says, how much time of the 2300 days was determined or cut off? You remember I told you one time that that word determine means amputate. Now, if I'm going to amputate something, that means I have to cut it off of what? Something that's bigger than it, right? So, how much of the 2300 days was determined or cut off for the Jewish people? 70 weeks. 70 weeks. So, consider, it says, uh, in your note there, it says, consider the 70 weeks as uh, weeks are determined or cut off of the 2300 days. But, 70 weeks would be how long? 490 years, because you take 70 weeks times 7 days, 49, 490, okay? So, um, question number 22 says, when are the 70 weeks and the 2300-day uh, and the 2300-day prophecy, when do they begin? Daniel 9, in 20, verse 25, what does it say there? From the going forth of the commandment, or the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, understand that there were actually three commands to go and restore and rebuild Jerusalem. But it wasn't until the third one, which is one we're talking about, that actually the full force and the full weight of it all was actually taking place. And that was 457 B.C. So that's the starting date. That's the starting date. Now... It says, what would happen at the end of the first 69 weeks? What's going to happen there? 
Bible says Messiah is going to come. Well, who, do we, who is the Messiah? And, and let me say this to you because you, you, you may not have put it together. But l- let me say this. When Jesus is talking to Peter, and they're talking about forgiveness, and Peter decides he will give Jesus a really generous offer. And Jesus you know, talks about you know, how many times you forgive, and Peter says, seven times. That's generous enough, right? Jesus says, Peter, how about 70 times seven? Where did Jesus get that from? I think he had been reading in the book of Daniel. What do you think? Because these 70 weeks are considered the time that God is giving the children of Israel to get their act together. You got 490 years. 490 years. And so I put it on the table here. It's in your, um, I put it on the computer here. It's also in your, your study guide, but it says 70 weeks. A score is 20, and three times 20 is 60. And two weeks is two, which is 69 weeks times seven days equals how much? Don't be careful what you answer. 483, because I thought some of you might say 490, but then I would know you hadn't added and you hadn't multiplied properly. So, and I'd have to send you back to Miss Gidmore to do some multiplication. Okay, so it's 483 days or years. In other words, it's from the starting time until the coming of the Messiah. This is one powerful timeline. This tells us exactly when Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come. How do you think that Anna and Simeon knew that Jesus was coming? Besides the fact that, that they, had, they were prophets and God had given them information, but how do you think they knew this? I think they had read the book of Daniel, and God had opened their eyes. So the anointed was going to come. Christ was going to come. Now, take your Bible and go to Luke, the third chapter. Luke, the third chapter, beginning with, um, let's go to verse 1 first. It says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, Herod, uh, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of uh, Iturea, and I'm not sure that I pronounced that right. And it says, in the region. Okay, good for you, John, that you did a good job there, Trachonitis. But we'll just consider that good. It says, um, and then it goes on, it says uh, in verse 21. So, by the way, that's the 15th year. That is 27 AD, by the way. Okay, and then in verse um, 21, verse 21 and 22. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I'd like to remind you that all three persons of the Godhead were at the same place at the same time. Jesus, the Father, says, this is my beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove. All three there at the same time. Um, But think about this. 500 years before it ever happened, God gave the information to Daniel. Is, I mean, does, does that not strike you as something that we should get excited about? Yes. See, to me, Bible prophecy tells me the Word of God is something I can trust. And that's what gets me excited. You know, I can learn Bible th- principles and things like this, but when I find prophecy and I see God showing us where we are and that I now know where we are in the stream of history, listen, I'm excited about that. That just, I just got to tell you about it. I can't help it. You know, 
uh, and, I, and, I, and, and we're just here, but I'm telling you, the coming of Jesus is sooner than when you first believed. It is sooner. But let's go to the next question there, 24. It says, what is the first message that Jesus announced after he was baptized? What was that phrase he used? The time is fulfilled. Jesus was saying, look, I was baptized in A.D. 27. I was right on time. And the time is at hand. It's it, the time is fulfilled. I'm here, right on time. I'm not early, and I'm not late. I'm right on time. I'm right on time. And I don't know, to me, this is exciting to know that the Bible not only tells us when the Messiah was going to come, but it tells us the exact year he begins his ministry. That, that's amazing. It's awesome to think about that. So, um, question 25 says, what is ultimately to happen to the Messiah? He's going to be cut off. What does that mean? The Bible says that he's going to die. For you, for me. So here's another point to remember. The Bible not only tells 500 years in advance that Jesus is going to come, then it tells us that he's going to, when he's going to start his ministry, and then it actually tells us when he's going to die. That's how Jesus knew, and he was always talking to the disciples and telling them that, but they were like, no, nah, no, nah, nah, that's not going to happen, Lord. That's not going to happen. And what did he tell Peter when Peter said that one time? Yeah. Get behind me, Satan. So, the Bible tells us the exact year that Jesus would die on the cross. Mm. Question number 26 says, How long does Messiah confirm the covenant with the Jews? One week. One week, seven days. Now remember, we, we already talked about 69, right? The 70th week would follow after the 69th week. Am I correct? I mean, I'll tell you about it later, but there's some people that they'll, they'll get to 69, and they'll say 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 2,000 years. Oh, 70. Now, did you guys learn to count like that in school? No. What follows immediately 69? 70. 70. That's what I learned too. That 70 always follows 69. But there are people that don't believe that. But we're going to talk about that later. So 70 weeks, the end of 70 weeks takes us right down to 34 A.D., and, you know, what, what actually happened in 34 A.D.? You remember? Stephen was stoned. And, and that's in the Bible as well. So it talks about this. So number 27 says, what does the Messiah do in the middle of the last week? What does he do? He brings an end to sacrifice. And if you remember correctly, when Jesus was dying on the cross, there was something happening in the sanctuary. Do you remember what it was? The veil was ripped from top to bottom. And top to bottom because human hands could not get to the top. If you'd have started at the bottom, maybe somebody, maybe somebody could have done it. But not from the top. Human hands did not rent that veil in two. And so, three and a half years after Christ's ministry began, he dies for you, for me. And as Jesus is hanging upon that cross, that veil is ripped in two. And it signifies that animal sacrifices are no longer needed. And only one person could ever stop animal sacrifices, and that would be Jesus. That was it. But 
In AD 34, three and a half years later, Stephen stoned and the persecution of Christians began. And it caused Christians to scatter everywhere, to go to different places. That was kind of a good thing, wasn't it? Because the gospel began to go to the ends of the earth. And so, question number 28 says, when does the 2300-day prophecy end? 1844, because think about it. If you have 490 years and you subtract them off of 2300 years, what do you come up with? No, you don't come up with 1844, you come up with 1810, right? Which takes you to 1844, and somebody, if you're smart enough, somebody, you, you might say, well, wait a minute, that should take us out to 1843. No, it takes you to 1844 because there's no zero year. So you go from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. Just in case somebody, you know, just a little tidbit of information you'll have in case somebody tries to trip you up on that, Okay. So, um, so you can look at, see this diagram here, you know, from 457 to 1844, and we'll talk later more about the sanctuary because that is really important stuff. But 1844, let's see. Question 29, what was to happen in 1844 at the end of the 2300 days? What was going to take place? The sanctuary is going to be cleansed. So from Daniel's day to our day, from 457 B.C. to 1844, what happened in the middle of the 19th century as the great prophecy came to an end? That's what we want to understand, right? What really happened in 1844? Because it talks about the cleansing of the sanctuary. And so for the next two lessons, we're going to be talking about what happened in 1844. Before we go to questions, and before I have prayer and we go to questions, I want to take you um, somewhere else. It's 2,300 days. So we have the 2,300 days. We'll walk you back through it. You have 457, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, down to 408. That's seven weeks or 49 years for the restoration of Jerusalem. And then from 408, the restoration of Jerusalem until Christ's anointing and his baptism was 62 weeks. So 62 and 7 is 69. And then from his baptism to the cross, is three and a half years. This is the last week. And then from there to 34 AD was the stoning of Stephen. And we have one full week. That's the 70th week, right? And I want you to understand that because now the rest of the time, which is 1810 years, has to progress till it's, it runs out. This is why the Bible calls this the longest time prophecy that we have. So the stoning of Stephen... 1810 years added to that takes us to 1844, which is the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, um, it's clear that the 70 weeks are part of the 2300 days, correct? All right. And if it is seen that it is a part of the 2300 days and not a separate prophecy, then it's impossible to put a gap theory in there, right? What I kind of shared with you a while ago. 69, 69, 69. Oh, this must be the 70th week. So 70 weeks are a part of the 2300 days. And the 69 weeks point to the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. Messiah means anointed one. Jesus was anointed at his baptism. And futurists believe that the prophecy points to the crucifixion and not the baptism of Christ. Okay? And nowhere does the prophecy indicate that there's a gap. Nowhere. Nor 
Are there any other biblical precedents for inserting the gap theory in any prophecy? So I want to talk about the gap theory. Can you read slowly what's falling to the bottom? This is not biblical. I want to say that again. What I'm about to tell you is not biblical. Did you hear me? Because I don't want you to go away from here thinking this is biblical. It's not biblical. But I want you to know it because there are people who think this. And so when they count down to 69, they keep going 69, 69, 69. Because they don't know when they're going to get to 70. But they forget we still have an eight, another 1,810 years to go after the 70th week. But that's because they take the 70 weeks and they count it as a separate prophecy. Okay? There were some people, and uh, uh, Lacunza, La, Lacunza was a Jesuit priest. Ribera is also a Jesuit priest, and he's the one who writes about um, the futurist theory. Alcazar writes about the preterist theory. Now, the futurist theory is obvious. Everything in Bible prophecy is in the future. Okay? And that's why a lot of times people say, well, we don't need to know anything from Revelation 3 or 4 onward because that's in the future and it doesn't concern us. I wonder why they call it the book of Revelation. Alcazar believed that everything in Bible prophecy was in the past. So we don't need to worry about Bible, Bible prophecy. It's all already taken place. We're living in the future. These two guys, both, all of these guys were Jesuit priests. And um, they developed these, these ideas so that the heat would be taken off the Pope as the Antichrist. So if everything's in the future, well, he can't be the Antichrist. If everything's in the past, he can't be the Antichrist. Okay? And then... This lady had a vision, and she began to promote this theory, but it kind of fell silent. Let me ask you this. She had a vision. Does that mean she was a prophet? Because remember, if they're not teaching biblical truth, it's a false prophet, right? I mean, Jesus talked about false prophets. So if he talked about false prophets, that means they have to be true prophets, too. And so this woman had this, and she's starting to preach this, which isn't biblical. So that tells you already you don't need to listen to her because she is not following biblical principles. This theory I'm telling you about is not biblical, okay? Uh, So the gap theory, it was done to silence the Protestant Reformation. That's what it was done for. That's why they came up with it, take the heat off the papacy. And the gap theory... Uh, it continues after a few years. It says the Schofield Bible then produces a Bible. And I don't have any, any of you ever heard of the Schofield Bible? Okay. And it produces this information in there, but it produces the futures theory. So all these years, this, this theory, these two theories lay dormant. And then all of a sudden this lady pr- starts promoting it. And then there was another guy who promotes it. And if you look there, Hal Lindsey promoted it in his books. And none of Hal Lindsey's prophecies have followed his predictions. Must be a false prophet. Did I tell you this was not biblical? Hmm? So, what is the gap theory? Here is their theory right here. First, now you notice the three and a half and the three and a half here. Three and a half and three and a half is how much? Seventy, which is the last week of the 70th week. Okay, so the secret rapture takes place. And after the secret rapture, there's going to be the temple rebuilt and animal sacrifices will be reinstalled or stated. And then the next thing that happens is Antichrist is going to come and he's going to remove the stigma from the Roman church. And then, after that, the sacrifice is going to be stopped. Jews will be converted, and they will, uh, they will actually convert the world. And then the second coming of Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you that I don't even know how you would present this in Scripture. You can tell people about it, but I don't know how 
To me, Scripture is very logical. God gives it to you in a format that you can understand. Now, you might first see it and say, I mean, when you first started studying this, you go, what? How, how did you? Well, the point is, is that as you study it, you begin, well, that makes sense. But I don't know how you make sense out of this. Because this is called a seven-year tribulation. And really... Why a gap theory? Did I tell you this isn't biblical? One, because dispensationalists, that means people who believe in the future, futurism, need it to prove the seven-year tribulation. That's what they need. This is, the th- this, is how, this is the only way they can prove it, or they think they can prove it or promote it. Okay? And then secondly, the dispensationalists need this theory because they lack the proper understanding of who is Israel? For them, Israel stands for everything. And this is what I'm going to say to you about Israel. When you go, people say, and I've been to Israel. If you ever get a chance to go to Israel, you should go to Israel. It's, it's nice to walk those places and see that even though you know that some of them may not be the real place, but to just go places that you know that Jesus may have walked. And he was there. And it was, it's great. I, I, I've been twice, and I loved every time I went. And every time I go, I remember more. So I'd like to go again, but I don't know that I will ever get to do that. But here's my point. When you go there and you see all of this and you understand what God has done, you realize that people call Jerusalem, what what, what they call it? No, not Jerusalem. There's another name for it. You know it. It starts with an H. A holy land. And I'm telling you, there ain't nothing holy there. There's not. The Jews don't even own the property that they had because it was taken away from them. The sanctuary, the original sanctuary is not there. But it's nice to go there and to see this. The, the city walls are still there. And, and it's nice to go there, but it's, it's, you know, you can call it the holy land, but... <laughs> To me, something that's land that's holy is where God is, okay? I mean, technically, I guess you could call the whole world the holy land, right? Because God is here. But that's not generally the way you would terminal, the terminology you would use, right? So I'm just saying to you, everything that you see today in history and theolo- theology and Protestant movement, they want to point back to Israel. But if you study the New Testament, you realize that God took away from um, the Jews their gospel commission in the book of Acts. And he says it goes to who? The Gentiles. Because they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. So that doesn't mean that Jews can't be saved. It means that Jews have to be saved like everybody else, and it's through their walk and their relationship and acceptance of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so, if you don't know who Israel really is, well, Israel is a thing of the past. Three, Christians like it because they hope and they believe that they will not have to go through any tribulation. Because they get raptured first. But, now, listen, folks. We've already learned God doesn't take you out of the tribulation. He takes you through the tribulation does it mean that god will never deliver you from any kind of tribulation i think there's possibility that he could do that but the point is is that we need to understand that generally he takes us through it okay so um christians the christians will go through a tribulation according to daniel 12 psalm 91 and according to john i'm not going to take you to those texts there but um anyway it says uh what does the devil why does the devil promote the gap theory Because you know this is ultimately where this came from, right? God didn't give it to them. And if God didn't give it to them, who do you think came up with it? The devil came up with it. So why does the devil do this? It it promotes a second chance. So see, you can just live the life you want to. Don't worry about it. And if the rapture takes place and you found, oh, look at all these clothes laying around here. What happened? Somebody didn't clean up. Oh, they're gone. Well, now you've got seven years to get it together. 
But it's not rocket science, folks. If you die before, let's say this was real, and you died before, and you weren't living for Jesus, you would be done. But yet that's kind of what it promotes is a second chance. So the gap theory is not biblical, but it's totally fatal because it could lead you to miss eternity. Jesus doesn't say, repent and follow me tomorrow. He says, today is the day. So the question is, are you thankful that the Bible predicted so clearly the baptism and the crucifixion of Jesus? Just think about that, that, that whole prophecy in Daniel 8 and all that it gives us when Jesus was going to come as a Messiah, when he was going to be baptized and start his ministry, and when he would die. Now we got to understand what's going to happen in 1844. That is going to be exciting. But when you see this, you're going to say, wow, you're going to see all these pieces start coming together. It's like, it's like now i got another piece of the puzzle. So, are you thankful? Amen. Jesus is coming. Let's look at our response questions. It says... If this lesson was clear and made sense to you, put a check in box one. There's a lot of material here. Now, let me say this. And just because it was a lot of material, I want you to understand, it doesn't mean you can't learn it. You can. I did. And I remember when I first started telling people about this, and I just would walk away from my Bible study, shaking my head, saying, Lord, how in the world did they ever understand that? I'm not even sure I understood it. How did that happen? But the more I studied it and the more I told people about it, the more it made sense. And I could see the pieces coming together because I had to study it for myself. And I began to realize that's why I thank the Lord for every time I can stand up and tell you about this because it reminds me I'm doing what God has asked me to do. He's led me here. I'm not here by happenstance. And you're not here by happenstance either. So if this lesson is clear, it made sense to you, put a check, box one. And then if you're thankful that Jesus Christ came on time and died on time and Want to renew your commitment to him as a Savior and Lord, put a check in box two. Our next lesson, what is the sanctuary? So we're going to learn. We're going to go there. And, that, and we won't stop just on one night on it because we're going to have to. It's, it takes too much. It's, it's too, too long. We'll have to go in more than one lesson. But anyway, what is the sanctuary? And our next lesson is when? 11 o'clock. It really is already Wednesday, isn't it? I was actually expecting you to say, two, uh, uh, say Wednesday. I knew you were expecting it. <laughs> I'm glad you reminded me that I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. <laughs> All right. So we meet together at 11. We'll talk about the sanctuary. And uh, let's bow our heads and let's have prayer. Father, we thank you for the time we have had together. It is so exciting to look at Bible prophecy and to see what you have done and how you have led us and how you have been guiding us, even before we knew it, Lord, hundreds of years before we knew it. Thousands of years. And it just, it's awesome to think about it. And to realize that when we put these things together, we can know how close we are to your coming. I pray that you will guide us, you'll keep us studying, keep us growing. And Father, I also pray that as we go home this evening, you'll keep us safe. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.